This episode of Live WP TV is sponsored by the Microsoft Nerd Center in Cambridge and HostGator.com. How to turn visitors on your website into pl- paying clients. And uh, we're going to talk about mostly strategy. Um, I know my way around WordPress, but I do not build WordPress sites necessarily. I am a management consultant and I work with small businesses to help them really sure up their operations and do all the things they need to do so that when the clients come to their website or wherever they get them from, they're in a position to handle them in their operation. Uh, And we'll talk about how you do that in just a minute. And we will take questions at the end, so if you have any questions, please hold them till the end and I'll be happy to answer them for you. So, turning your visitors into clients. There really is a process to this, and there are no shortcuts. It's really about being strategic, and one of the biggest problems that I see people make is they try to shortcut the process, and it always fails miserably. So we're going to talk about how you can use automated tools so that you don't have to shortcut the process, and yet you still don't have to do all the work manually or yourself. There's a life cycle. And we're going to kind of use this as our baseline. We're going to talk about how to attract, capture, nurture, and convert your visitors. Now, most of you have probably already had some success attracting them to your website. So we're going to give that one a little bit of a check off. However, I am going to circle back to that topic and share just a few things that I see people make mistakes with um, so that you can get a better Uh, return on your attraction so that more of the visitors actually decide to click and do something. So let's get started. First of all, you need to have goals. One of the biggest mistakes I see people make is that they put some uh, great report or white paper or something out on their website as an opt-in or freebie and they, they give people something they think people need but it isn't necessarily what their would-be customers want. So you really need to understand the goals of what you're doing. That's where you've got to start. And a strategy sometimes can be a little tedious and boring, but it really pays off when you look at it in detail. So you want to understand your goals. You want to know what kinds of things you want to get out of this. What do you want people to do when they come to your site? Do you want them to join a membership site? Do you want them to download a white paper? Do you want them to sign up for your newsletter? That's kind of boring these days, but what do you want them to do? What are your goals? And look at the end of the process. Uh, Start with the end in mind, as Stephen Covey says. You want to look at the end game. What is it you want to accomplish? Do you want to sell them something? Uh, You need to understand your goals fully before you can start laying out your strategy. So what do you want your visitor to do, and what outcome do you want? Those are the two questions to ask yourself. And then more importantly, what are your would-be clients' goals? What do they want to accomplish? What did they come to your site for? You need to understand what they want so you can give it to them, because that's how they're going to be happy and maybe become clients. And the questions you want to ask there are what is your client looking for? What did they search on? What did they come there to find out? And what do they want to accomplish? And I know these seem really rudimentary and pretty simple and more like common sense than anything else, but I am always surprised at the number of people that don't think about this. They have some great thing, some great idea, some great paper, they put it out there, and their conversion rate isn't as good as it could be because they haven't done this. So there's a piece to this that is important, and almost no one does this, and that's to research. So if you have an ideal client in mind, someone you're trying to attract, you want to do some research and find out what they're talking about, find out what their problems are, understand where they're coming from. That question that we always ask, what's keeping them up at night? At 3 a.m. when they wake up, what are they worried about? And there's some really easy research tools you can use that are readily available to help you find this information quickly so that you can tailor what you're providing to the problems that they're trying to solve. My favorite one is Amazon. You can go right out to Amazon and Google your topic, 
or Google a problem you think they have and see how many books have been written about it. How recent are they? How are they selling? If they get lots of stars from people and good reviews, read the reviews. Find out what people are saying about it. it what problem did it address? What did they get out of it? There are huge clues out on Amazon for you to get some research about what your would-be clients want. Another good place to look is any of the groups, LinkedIn groups, Facebook groups, any forums, anywhere where people hang out that you would like to attract to your business. How many people in the room are business owners? Okay, most of you. So what business owner doesn't need more clients? Is there anybody in the room who doesn't need more clients? No. <laughs> So doing this research makes it so much easier to attract the people you want to attract because you begin to understand what it is they need. SurveyMonkey is another great tool that you can use. It's very inexpensive to even buy results to a survey. So if you create a few survey questions and keep it small, 10 questions or less, go out and do your research and then test it primarily uh, by doing a survey yourself, ask a few questions, and you can pay to have people in a certain demographic respond to your survey. I've done it a few times, and it's amazing. You spend your whatever your budget is in like five minutes. You have hundreds of responses, which is great, because then you get the information right away, and you don't have to wait. So I love doing primary research when I'm, you're about to launch a new idea or a new product. It's a, a really key thing to do, and it's so easy with SurveyMonkey. Anybody use SurveyMonkey in the room? Right, some of you have, that's awesome. So that's what I wanted to say about attract because I think people make the mistake of not doing the research and they put things out there that aren't necessarily what the client wants. You need to be in a position to anticipate what they want. That You're gonna hear me say that word so many times tonight. It's not about what they need. They're, they don't know what they need. How many people realize that clients sometimes don't know what they need? They really, they have a symptom. They want to alleviate the symptom. It's about what they want. Giving them what they want lets you sell them what they need. Let me say that again. Giving them what they want allows you to sell them what they need. But you have to give them what they want first, or they're just going to go away and they're not going to listen to you. So that brings us to capture. Capturing is getting their attention. And we want to grab their attention because we have about seven seconds to do that. Seven seconds. That is the time it takes for someone to make a decision about whether or not they're going to stay on your website, whether or not they're going to click that opt-in box, whether or not they're going to listen to anything you have to say or read anything. Many of the words... Um, or the, rather the websites that I see today are very wordy and there's no way somebody can get to the meat of the matter in seven seconds. So you've got to have something that grabs their attention right front and center and helps them make a decision whether or not they're going to go on. And if it's a long paragraph, it probably is going to get clicked off because they just don't have time. We're all busy. We have lots of things to do and things going on in our lives and distractions and we're just not able to spend a lot of time reading a lot of things on our website. So we want to grab their attention. And the goal then is to capture their contact information by giving them something they want so that you can start a conversation. It isn't, the goal isn't to sell them something. People that try to sell the minute a visitor comes to the site Unless you have the best thing since sliced bread, there are some success stories about selling right away, and certainly there are uh, websites that have shopping carts and some sales do occur. But the chance of somebody actually buying what you have and paying money right away before they really know much about you is slim to none. There's about 7% of the buying public out there that are ready to buy what you have, 7%. The chance of that 7% ending up on your website and buying, it happens, but you've got to get to that other 93% that isn't quite ready to buy, and that's what we're going to do in this conversation that we're going to have. So your goal is to get their information so you can have a conversation. And there's a direct correlation between how much information they're willing to give you 
and what they see the perceived value of what you're offering as. So if you're offering you know, some 25-page white paper they know they're not going to have time to read, they're not going to see that as valuable, and they're not going <laughs> to opt in, perhaps. So you, first of all, when you do something along the lines of opting in, you want to ask the least amount of, of information possible. So if you can get away with just first name and email, that's the acceptable norm. Most people will give you their first name and their email. There's somehow they think that's being uh, anonymous. It's not, but, <laughs> but that's a perception. So when you capture um, them with something they want, you want to make sure that it solves a problem they want. Here I go with my wants. They want to solve. Because they're, if it's something they need to do, but they don't want to do it, eh, not going to happen. Give them information they want to have, that they're seeking, information that they need. And, or help them do something that they really want to do. It's the perceived value that counts. They have to look at it as being very valuable to them in that moment, right then and there. It solves their problem or helps them get some answers. That's how you give them something they want. And your research helps you identify what that is. The research that you do on Amazon and some of the other places that we talked about gives you an opportunity to hear the conversation that's already going on out there so that you know what they're talking about. And that helps you identify the problems they have and then you can deal with the solutions. So you want to make sure that whatever you provide as your opt-in freebie is something that's easily consumable. Ebooks, a lot of people do ebooks. If they're too long, people don't read them. Um, you can still do an ebook, it's impressive, but put all the good stuff up front because they're probably only going to read a little bit of it. Um, I like things like checklists or easy to use tools. I have a tool out on my website that's called the 30 minute productivity fix, and it gets a lot of hits, and I do really well with that because people know it's going to take them 30 minutes and they're going to be more productive at the end of it. They buy into that. Uh, videos are nice, but keep them short. A couple of one or one and a half minute videos is better than a five minute video. Even if the sum total of your three or four videos ends up being seven minutes, people will watch a little snippet. They will X out before the end of a five to seven minute video. Reports, uh, okay, but if they're too long, again, people don't read them. Um, if you start with an executive summary in a report, you have a much better chance of getting your information in the hands of people uh, because, again, the, the meaty stuff will be up front even if it's in a condensed version. In that case, they might go back and read some of the rest of it. Quizzes. People love quizzes. How many people read magazines? Oh, only a few, even online. One of the things that you'll always see in magazines is quizzes. People love quizzes. Uh, some of the women's magazines, oh my God, the titles of the quizzes, I won't even go into some of them here, but uh, the titles of some of the quizzes are, you know, is he or isn't he? You know, they're so, you've got to open it up and take the quiz and find out. And that's the kind of attention-grabbing thing you want to put on your business site. I know it sounds a little hokey, but that's what people like. Look at the shelves in the grocery store at the magazines. I guarantee you almost every one of them will have some splashy, crazy headline like that. And that's what you need to think in terms of, those splashy headlines. Take uh, some time, go to the newsstand, just look at the covers of magazines. Spend 15, 20 minutes and you'll be amazed and it'll make you a better copywriter in terms of your headlines. Uh, one of the things you can do is also offer something like a website audit. If you build websites, uh, and people are worried about theirs, it's not getting the hits they want, maybe it doesn't look so good to them, they think they need to redo it, you can offer something like a free website audit where it's a controlled situation. We're going to talk a little bit more about that going forward. But again, you want to make sure that it's a quick hit, something they can consume easily, quickly, and get some results that solves a problem they have in that short time frame. Easy, right? Okay, so I put the capture workflow up here. Uh, some of you may not be able to read this because it's um, not as big as I would have liked it to be, 
Um, I have a worksheet with all this, and I know Rego and Tom are going to put uh, this presentation up there, so you'll have it that way too. But I put this up here because I wanted to talk through what should happen during the capture process. So we start out with a web page visit, and then there has to be some sort of a call to action. This is a piece people forget. They put the opt-in box up there, but there's no strong call to action. And believe it or not, people have to be told what to do. So that's a very important piece. And there should be exactly one call to action, not a, a lot of them. So on one page, there should be one call to action. In the past, not too distant past, it was common to put your opt-in in, in a widget on the side of your WordPress site. Don't do that anymore. Put it somewhere else because I'm an advocate of having many lead magnets. If you address, uh, as many of us do, more than one problem for your client, then you should have more than one lead magnet, more than one way to capture them. Because some people are going to come at it from this point of view. Others are going to be more worried about this problem. So you have a better chance of catching everybody and making a better return on your opt-in investment if you are coming at it from a couple of points of view. That means every page of your website should have exactly one call to action and one opt-in. They can be different, so there's variety, but don't put more than one on a page. Then next, you want to um, be sure that some sort of a thank you for opting in goes out. And delivering the lead magnet is key. There are many, many cases where people have opted in to get something and then received something that did not match up with their expectation. That's a huge problem. And frankly, it has made it more difficult to get people to opt in for things. So make sure you have integrity in what you're saying and what you're delivering. Make sure that when you say they're going to get this and it solves this problem, make sure that it does so that when they get that that free piece of information that they're wowed by it and not disappointed. That's huge because you will lose your credibility and their trust and that will be the end of that relationship. So be in integrity in terms of what you deliver and deliver it right away. We're going to talk about systems that help you do that. So there's no delay. When I uh, opt in, I want to get that right away. I don't want to have to wait for it to show up in my email some number of hours later. And then you want to add it to whatever you use as a customer relationship management tool so that you can track what's going on in terms of your conversation and your engagement. And then you want to be sure that within whatever email system you're using, you're, you have the ability to tag the item with some referencing information about where the source of where this person came from. And then you want to be able to segment your lists so that you can have different conversations with different people. So that's a, a more sophisticated look at how to use an email marketing system. And some of the lower end products, uh, which are very good like Constant Contact or, or MailChimp, um, they do allow for segmenting, but it's a more manual process. So you've really got to think through that workflow a little more and make sure that you've accounted for everything. But it's really important that you're not having the same conversation with everybody. Uh, that, that will be a, a kill, killer right there. So some tools that I like for um, capturing. I like to uh, use lead pages, and I know there are probably some graphic designers in the audience. Can I have a show of hands of everybody who's a graphic designer? Yeah, you guys, you, you don't like lead pages because you don't have enough flexibility. <laughs> But for the rest of us, I can put a, a full-blown sales page or a webinar opt-in page up in 10 minutes or less using lead pages. And it has incredible integration, which we'll talk about a little bit. Um, it, does, it is template-based, and you don't have complete flexibility. You have a lot of flexibility. You can change the colors and the fonts and make it uh, match your brand. You can change out the pictures. But in terms of where things appear on the page, you do not have flexibility there. That's the bad news, but the good news is the templates that are out there have been used and tested and they have a feature where you can uh, see the uh, templates in terms of how they ranked in terms of success. So you can pick a template you know is gonna get good traction, which saves you an awful lot of time and that's why I like it. 
Now, if you feel too constrained by lead pages, there's another similar product called ClickFunnels, which also does a lot of the same things. It's a little bit more flexible, so uh, some people prefer that. It's also, of course, with flexibility, you also get a little bit more complexity, and you probably are going to need 20 minutes to put up your page instead of 10. And then um, email systems, if you, you or your clients um, aren't that sophisticated and they want to use their email system, they of course have sign-up forms which can be used. The goal is to get the information captured and in your email system because that's when you can begin to have the conversation. The conversation has to happen in your email marketing system. All right, so that's capture. Now the most important thing is nurturing. Nurturing is about building the relationship. How many people have heard that before someone will buy from you, they have to know, like, and trust you? Okay, that's pretty common knowledge. This is where that happens, building that relationship. So nurturing is the thing that you have to do, and oddly enough, it's the one step everybody wants to shortcut. Nobody wants to take the time to do this. It's a lot of work, but this is where the rubber hits the road. This is what makes people interested in buying what you have. So you cannot shortcut this. Now here are some really staggering statistics, and I won't read them all to you, but 40% of salespeople never follow up with a prospect. Never, ever, ever. 80% of sales are made on the 5th to the 12th contact. Yeah. So you've got to do the follow-up. You've got to do that. If you capture somebody with a lead magnet on your website and you don't do anything to follow up with them, you are missing a huge opportunity. And the good news is you can automate this so most of it happens in the background without you having to do a lot of things manually. So let's look at that process just a little bit. We talked about capturing. The things that you need to do before you can get the sale is get to know them or qualify them a little bit, and then you want to nurture and engage with them. That's the follow-up piece, because that's really what turns these leads into prospects. And then you want to decide who are your hot prospects, and you do that by inviting them to have a sales conversation with you, which we'll talk about. That can take a lot of forms. We'll talk about that in a minute. How many people got butterflies in their stomach when I said sales conversation? Don't be shy. You know you did. Um, it is, but we can make it simple so that you feel comfortable with it. You don't have to be, and I hope I'm not insulting anyone, but you don't have to be the used car salesman in the plaid suit. You really don't. So you want to get that sales conversation to happen, and then you need to ask for the sale, and that's how you make them a, cl a client. Now, asking for the sale seems like a really simple thing, doesn't it? But I am blown away at the number of people that get all the way to the sales conversation and they forget to actually ask for the sale. And the result of that is no sale. So, great conversation, thanks for meeting with me, awesome, oh your products are great, I love them, Whew, nobody buys anything. And it happens a lot, believe me. So the good news is we have automated marketing systems, and they can be set up to capture your leads and do all this engaging and nurturing, and it can be happening automatically behind the scenes 24-7 while you're doing other things. So what it does is it warms up your prospects so that they're you know, okay with taking a phone call from you, and all you have to do is make some sort of direct contact with them to have the sales conversation and ask for the sale. Sounds easy, right? It is. It's very easy. So you have a conversation to build the know, like, and trust fact. And you need a strategy to do that. You need to refer back to the goals that you established in our discussion earlier. And you need to figure out what to say, how often, and how long you have to talk to them before they're going to be ready to buy. What to say we'll get to in a minute. How often is a function, and how long you need to have the conversation, is a function of two things. One is, what is the price point of your product? If it's low, then you can have fewer uh, touches with them, and you can ask for the sale earlier. If it's medium or higher, you need to have more nurturing going on before they'll be ready to talk with you about buying. 
The other piece of it is how complex is what you do. If it's simple, then again, you don't need to talk too much before you can get them to have that sales conversation. But if you're buying a home or doing some complex financial transaction or something of that nature, they're going to want to talk about it a little bit longer than they would if they're just buying a, a customized pad of paper for their office. So it really depends on the complexity of your product and the price point. That determines how long and how frequently you need to talk to them during this conversation. And remember, this whole purpose of this is to warm them up so they will take your call. It's to get rid of that old cold call because those don't work. And again, here's a process which I know you probably can't see very well, but you'll get a copy of this. We do the opt-in, the thank you, we delivered their lead magnet, and now we've passed this information back to our email marketing system and this sequence starts, the one that's vertical. And we want to do things like um, maybe if, if you're building a website for them, let's use that example, we want to do things like help them understand where they can go to get their web score. How does that help you? Well, they find out it's not very good, so then they're going to be interested in talking more to you, aren't they? Again, strategic, what you say to them. Um, you might want to talk with them about colors and fonts that are uh, great to do, the latest trends in website design and so on and so forth. Because again, then they're, they're going to do what? Look at theirs and go, ooh, I need some help. Uh, everything you do has to be strategic and it should be driving them to the point where they're going to want your services. And in this case, we're using the example of designing a website or redesigning as the case may be. Uh, again, you could offer something like that website audit that we talked about by explaining to them how you might do that over the phone, or look at their website and report to them, or uh, something along the lines of a quiz slash, uh, you know, score they get on their website that you develop. And all of those things are things they're going to be interested in if they're worried about their website. So there are strategic conversations that are going to drive them to realizing that they, are, they want, not only need, but want what you do. So what should you say in some of these email campaigns? You want to always make sure that you're providing good, valuable content, and you want to try and present it in words that the client uses. So again, that research is key to understand how they're talking about it. One of the things that we suffer from as people that are more technical, and um, we, we have lingo in our industry, don't we? we? We have WordPress lingo, and we have technology lingo, and sometimes our clients don't respond to that. We need to be talking in their lingo. So you need to understand how they refer to it. Uh, and use those terminology. Even if it just about kills you to say it in those words because you know it's not right, that's what they're going to respond to. And it has to be all about them. It has to be all about them. You're trying to solve their problem. It's articles, tips, resources, frequently asked questions is a huge place to go for good fodder to put in email campaigns. Things that clients have asked you in the past Everybody wants to know if one person asked you that question, there are other people out there that would like to get that answer. You want to make sure that it clarifies or even solves their problem. And a lot of times clients will say to me, well, if I put stuff out there that solves their problem, why will they hire me? Well, the reason is because they won't solve the problem themselves, but they want to know you can. And they want to know it's solvable. And they will call you to solve it. There are going to be a few do-it-yourselfers. But most people out there want help. They don't want to do it themselves. So don't ever be afraid to give away your good stuff, your best stuff. That's what's going to sell people. Give away your best stuff. They will come to you, and they will ask you to help them with it. Paint possibilities. It's one thing to um, talk about what's wrong and their pain and address those needs. But after you get them so depressed about, let's use the website example, actually, after they're so depressed about the way their website looks, I mean, you've got to paint the possibilities with, you can do this, and it's possible to do that, and it's easy, and blah, 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 it doesn't cost a lot, because that's when they're going to get interested. And finally, help them get to know you better, and that's sort of a byproduct of doing the rest of this right. 
that's a byproduct because they will, hear, they will hear your voice, they will see your expertise, they will identify you as somebody that really wants to help them and knows their stuff if you do this right. Now, as important as what you say is what you should not say, you don't want to be talking about you. They don't care about your credentials, they don't care about your products, features, the you know, stuff that you sell, your promotions, your sales, your pricing. They don't care about any of that. What do they care about? Can you solve my problem? Do you understand my problem and can you solve it? That's the only thing they care about. And it's the problem they think they have, remember, not the problem you know they have. You can get to that later. First, you've got to get your foot in the door. It's all about them. So you need to come up with a sequence of emails that address these issues. And remember, we talked about the frequency, how often you need to say something. Uh, you know, that might be a couple of days. There's, in the worksheet I'm going to share with you, there's a formula in there for figuring out how frequently. And a lot of times people will ask me, well, you, you know, I've heard people don't like to get emails. They just delete them. How many people feel like emails just get deleted and people don't even look at them? If you're going to make a decision about whether to read an email or not, what do you have to do? You have to look at two things. You have to look at who it's from, and you have to look at the subject line to make the decision whether or not you're going to read it. If your subject line is killer, you've done your job, even if they don't open the email. So don't give up on email because it is really the way to have the conversation with people. They might put it somewhere where they'll look at it later. Maybe they will, maybe they won't, but your subject line is key. And then as you send these emails, you don't want to pester people. You want to uh, make sure they're valuable. You want to space them out a little bit, and you never want your campaign to go over 45 days. And again, that's a, a function of the two things we talked about. How complex is your product and what does it cost? If you have an inexpensive product or service or a low-end thing you're offering first, maybe your sequence is only going to be 21 days, a couple of weeks. If it's a medium-sized thing, maybe it's 30 days. If it's a big financial transaction or selling a home or something more complex, then maybe it's going to go the full 45 days. But you don't ever want to go out much longer than that. 30 days is usually the max. That's at the end of the campaign, you want to be able to pick up the phone and know they're warmed up and they will take your call. And they may not take it the first time, but just because they don't answer the phone the first time doesn't mean you shouldn't call them back. Remember, follow up, follow up, follow up. So it's important to know what to do when you make that call. When you make the first call and you don't get anyone on the phone, you don't leave a message. You just hang up and try again another day. If you call two or three times and you still don't get them, then it's okay to leave a message. If you call and leave a message, people can ignore you. So you want to be sure that what you do is get, actually get that person. And give it two or three tries before you get to the point where you don't, um, you know, you can leave a message at that point. All right, so let's talk about some of the tools for email marketing. Um, on the lower end of the scale, we have uh, Constant Contact, which is very well known. It has sign-up forms. It does tagging and segmenting, although manually. It's an okay option if your client has a low-end budget. So is MailChimp. MailChimp, there's even a free version, but I would caution you, the free version does not use autoresponders. How many people know what autoresponders are? Okay, good. That's what helps to make this whole thing automated. And if you don't pay for MailChimp, you don't get the autoresponders. So that's not an option unless you pay for it. Another one is iContact. Uh, they recently came out with a pro version, which is uh, sort of in the middle tier, which is the second row of solutions. Uh, they also have their low-end solution. And all of those low-end solutions are less than $30 a month for most clients. Very affordable. Uh, in the middle tier, there's Get Response. Uh, there's some tools that uh, use video too, like BombBomb. And uh, my personal favorite, which is Hatchbuck, which is not a very well-known email marketing system, but it's, it's elegant and it's easy to use and you can build things in it very fast. It works very well. 
And then at the high end of the spectrum are things like Entreport, Infusionsoft, HubSpot, and there are others. Those are more sophisticated. They have if-then logic. They can, many of them do e-commerce as well as just the email marketing segment. So um, it really depends on where your budget is and you know, what you need to accomplish. Again, as with any piece of software, you want to sit down and understand what you're trying to do with it before you make the selection. And then pick the one that works best for you. The key is start where you are and make sure whatever you decide to use has a feature that allows you to export all your information so that you can export and import it into the next step up. Um, personally, I have gone through uh, three systems. I used eye contact for a while, then I graduated to Hatchbuck, and now I'm an Infusionsoft user. So it really just depends on where you are in your business. The other nurture tools that we need to talk about is a customer relationship management system. Now, if you are um, looking for a real low-end solution, a lot of the email marketing systems capture enough contact information so that you could use it as a customer system, but typically it doesn't have the ability to tag you so that you ha can do follow-up or make an appointment or something like that. My um, favorite low-end solution is Less Annoying CRM. That's the first one there. Less Annoying CRM, and it is. It is so great. Everything's on one screen. You can attach documents to it. You really get a snapshot of your prospect or client. The, the pipeline piece of it is flexible. I've even built workflows for clients and used it as a customer service tool. So it's very, very flexible. And the best part of it is it's $10 a month per user. You can't beat that for what it provides. Another good one is contact, Contactually, which is a little bit more robust. But of course, with robustness comes more complexity. Uh, it's a little bit more expensive. And then kind of the, the granddaddy, the Cadillac, is Salesforce. But I find that for most of my clients, the small business owner who, you know, maybe has a couple million dollars in revenue and 20 or less employees, Salesforce is overkill for them. They don't use most of the functionality, so why have something that's so complicated and overbearing, staring you in the face every day? The key to these systems is to keep them simple so that you use them. When they become complex, people get nervous, they stop using them, and then they don't benefit anyone. Okay, so that's um, nurture. Lastly, we want to talk about converting. And you must have a direct contact conversation with a prospect to convert. You cannot do this automatically. You have to have a conversation in a direct manner with them. But it can take many forms. It could be that website audit that we talked about if you do websites. It could be uh, anything. I do a um, what I call a, a more freedom now coaching call for my uh, CEO clients who are like pulling their hair out because their operation isn't scaling the way it needs to to accept all the business that they're, they're taking in. So we sit down and talk about how we get them out from under that problem. And I give them a 30 minute call which I call more freedom now call and I provide value, I give them solutions, I give them a lot of my best stuff. Do they implement it? No, they can't implement it. They're gonna call me back to do that, but it helps me show what I do and they walk away from that free call with some good, valuable solutions. Now your sales conversation can be in, in person or it can be by telephone. It can even be an offer on a teleseminar or a webinar or a live stream if you do those. You can offer on the web, but you have to have a shopping cart, credit card processing, good e-commerce, and you have to be able to write great sales copy. That's the key. And most people aren't that good at that. So you might want to hire a copywriter who can do that for you. And it is possible to sell on the web, web with a shopping cart. But again, you're not going to sell a $5,000 coaching package on the web probably without talking to the person. So it depends on the complexity and the price. And it must have value for them, whatever method you choose to have your sales conversation in, it must have value for them, even if they don't buy from you. They have to walk away feeling like they got something from you. 
You need to make an offer, even in a free sales conversation, an offer to work with you. That's asking them to buy. So you have to decide what that offer is. What do you, usually you're going to talk to them and sort of ascertain their needs and then customize your offer based on whatever it is that they need. But you must make an offer during that sales conversation. You must ask them to buy or you've wasted your time. So that's really all about attracting, capturing, nurturing, and converting. And one of the other features that I really like about lead pages is that it gives you the ability to use what they call lead boxes, which are just buttons and pop-ups that you can create. I use them on blogs. So if you blog, and um, like that 30-minute productivity fix that I mentioned, if you take um, and write a blog article about it, I put a button on the blog article. If they click it, they get my opt-in box, first name, email, and the promise of getting my 30-minute productivity fix. And that is a really valuable item. Actually, Reiko's done it. She knows uh, it, it's actually pretty fun to do, and it works. And um, they can then get that, and I've captured their name and email address so I can have a conversation with them. But another thing that Lead Pages does, and this is <clears throat> one of the reasons why I really like that tool, is it allows you to get more than just their name and email. It allows you to get their phone number. Now, I, I'd like you to try an experiment. I have a worksheet, as I mentioned, for this. And if you want to get the worksheet, and I promise, swearing in front of Reiko and Tom, I will not email you anything. This is just an exercise. So that you, and I will not call you, okay? Um, so this is just an exercise so you can see firsthand the kind of power that this lead digit is. So if you take out your phone and you text your success without a space in the middle to 33444, you will see what happens. You'll get a text back that will ask you to put in just your email address, and then you will immediately get hopefully if it works right, because I built it this afternoon, hopefully um, you'll get that um, worksheet. And you can go through all of those questions and that whole process that we talked about today, and there's also some additional things on it. So you can use that to take your clients through that or use it yourself, however you want to use it. So I invite you to check that out, and I just want to say thank you very much for having me today. Thank you, Reiko and Tom. Enjoyed being here and meeting many of you. And um, that's it. Thank you. Questions? Oh, questions. Yes. <laughs> of course, there might be questions. <laughs> yes? Uh, what tools could we use for those quizzes? There are a number of good quiz tools out there. If you just um, <coughs> Google them, you'll find there's a couple of good ones. Um, they're a little bit limiting, so I like to build my quizzes on JotForm. And JotForm has a way to calculate, so I'm even able to push back a score to the person the minute they submit it. So that's how I do it, but um, there are some other tools out there. Yes? Um, do you think, what do you think of the modals that pop up and just jump in your, down your program? I mean, really I, I don't like them either. Um, statistics show that those pop-ups work. I don't use them. Um, I re my personal, and this is a philosophical thing, I think, my personal philosophy is if, if you want something, tell me and then I'll, I'll give it to you. But I'm not in your face all the time. That's, per that's just not me personally. So, but they do work. Statistics show that exit pop-ups are very powerful. Yes? Go out and find some groups that have people in it that you'd like to attract and start by listening. Just get out, get accepted to the group, and just start listening. Maybe comment on a few things, but mostly you're there to, to observe and learn. So it's all in the listening. And make it a regular practice for, you know, a week or two. Really get out there and hear the conversation. Yes? My email, which is Hotmail, puts everything into my junk folder. Do you have any suggestions for yeah, get Get off a of hotmail. <laughs> really? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Gmail. A lot of people have hotmail. A lot do. Sending to. Well, I don't think that matters no. too much. No. But doesn't it matter if my email's 
go into there. Yes, it does. And one of the things you can do as you're um, connecting with people, on that first opt-in box, you can say, you know, be sure and um, note me in your address book so that it doesn't go to spam or something like that. Um, I just say, honestly, everything I get asks me to do that, and I never want to. Yeah, it and is a problem. I think probably pretty typical. It is a problem. Yeah. Yep. Um, I like Gmail, even though it does have the different tabs at the top, because, I don't know, personally, I'm sort of compelled to see what's out there, even if I don't take too hard a look. I don't ever ignore it. Where some of the other email providers, if it goes into the junk file, I may never look at that. Right. So, yes, way in the back. A call, no, 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 a call to action on a page that has an offer for a, a free lead okay. magnet, right. Okay. And it's simply something as quick as, um, you know, get, get my, uh, take my quiz now, or learn, you know, did he or didn't he, learn now, you know, that kind of thing. Or did she or didn't she, I don't want to be sexist. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes? Are you familiar with AWeber? A little bit, yep. It's good, yeah. It's a good, good product. I have never used it. I don't know a lot of people that do use it, but um, it gets good reviews, so it's yeah. They're all good. They're, I really have never met a really horrible email product. Um, one of the key things to look at, though, is deliverability. What are their deliverability statistics? That's the key thing when you want to select an email provider. Some email providers that will remain nameless are really good at marketing their products and not so good on deliverability. So that's the thing to watch. Yes? A single? Magnet. You don't have to, but if you want to have more than one magnet, put them on separate pages. Well, yeah, it is, and uh, you know, the, the thinking is that when you put more than one thing on a page, it confuses the user, and a confused mind never buys. So, um, unless you can make both really compelling, I mean, I've seen some websites where they have the three different, like, blocks, and they serve, serve up this to one group of people and this to another group of people. You could do something like that. That wouldn't be confusing because it would be clear who it was directed at. But you need to be a little careful because if people see too much and they get confused, they're gone. 